Coming up on Theater Talk. This was not part of my master plan to become the largest not-for-profit in America, not even to be on Broadway, let alone to have three Broadway theaters. It was just seizing opportunities as they came along and exploiting them successfully, honestly. It was not part of a master plan. But do you ever think, this is too much, this is too big, I can't handle it anymore? I, I live in a constant state of terror. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. Michael Riedel is out on the road promoting his book, but I am so delighted to again be joined by Jesse Green, chief and only critic for New York Magazine. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. So tonight, we are going to talk about the largest and one of the most successful, if not the most successful, nonprofit theaters in the United States, The Roundabout, which is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. We're very happy to be joined by The Roundabout's artistic director, Todd Hames, Jim Carnahan, its director of artistic development and casting, and Scott Ellis, its associate artistic director. Welcome to you all. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for wearing the roundabout uniform. I mean, God. <laughs> Literally, it looked like we all called each other. I, I wore this two morning. just to join the spirit. Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, we... Susan, you mentioned the largest uh, not for profit theater in the country. Um, wasn't always that way. No. Uh, I, who's been there the longest? I guess you have. When you came in, first of all, what year was that? How long into it? 83? It was founded in 1965 by Gene Feist. I was brought in in 1983. The company had been in bankruptcy since 1977, ended up being one of the longest bankruptcies in the history of bankruptcy law. Um, there was tax fraud, embezzlement, and we couldn't meet the payroll. So Other than that, things were great. What was the size of the theater around the time you came in? How many, how many theaters and how many people? There was a 300-seat theater, a 150-seat theater. There were, the budget was $2 million. The deficit was two and a half million dollars, <laughs> which for those of you who know anything about accounting is not good. Yeah, it doesn't and, sound right. No, it doesn't sound good. And uh, we, even in those days, though, I will say they had about 14 or 15,000 subscribers. And uh, was there a specific mission with which the theater was founded? And by the time you came aboard, was it still functioning uh, according to that mission? It was funded to be, A, a subscription theater, so sort of the primacy of subscribers, which didn't mean single ticket buyers couldn't come, but it was primacy of subscribers, very low prices, and largely to do revivals of the classics, fairly narrowly defined, heavily Ibsen, Shaw, Chekhov, Strindberg, those type of plays. And what is the meaning of, a, for people who haven't uh, studied this carefully, the difference between a subscription theater and other kinds of producing organizations in terms of what that says about the kind of material you can do? Or well, most not-for-profits are subscription. In our case, basically every, everybody has to buy, if not the entire seven-play season, at least five out of the seven-play subscription season. Um, and the good news, of course, is that it gives you, the institution, a solid financial base on which to operate because you have, uh, in this case, we have 30,000 season subscribers. So we get a certain amount of money in from them every year. That's sort of, I'm not saying it's guaranteed. We have to work for it, but we get it. The bad news is that um, subscription has become a smaller part of our budget, subscription income, than it used to be. Uh, so there's more, there's more pressure on um, single ticket sales and particularly on contributions. Right. The good news is that the subscribers are unbelievably loyal and really sophisticated theater goers. So they will sit through uh, three and a half hours of a play, even when it's not a fabulous production. And hope Wait, some you've of done are... productions that are not <laughs> fabulous? We have done on occasion. <laughs> you heard it here <laughs> first. Productions <laughs> that are not... And, and they will appreciate it for what it is. And, you know, I get... They all, every subscriber gets my email. I respond to every email personally. Um, so I get very... Immediate <laughs> Is that fair? Isn't that crazy? I mean, I'm, I'm actually, a little shocked to hear that. People have such loyalty to you and your theater. Now, when did you come on board, Scott? I came on board 
wow, probably 20 years ago when She Loves Me. Yes. Well, oddly enough, enough so you, she loves you've me. already done She Loves Me, and, and one of the things we're going to talk about is that you're doing a revival right. of She Loves Me in the current right. season. How, how did you first get attached to that production? You mean the originally? The original one. The original one was I had a meeting with Todd and about coming in to direct something for The Roundabout. and uh, I had seen, just to give him promotion that he won't give himself, I had seen what I thought was the most brilliant um, musical review I had ever seen in my life at that time called And the World Goes Round, which oh. was a huge off-Broadway candor and ebb hit review. And it was directed by a very young man named Scott Ellis and choreographed by a very young woman named <laughs> Susan Stroman. And so I wanted to meet Scott, so he came into the office. And we, t we talked about a few things and just, you know, I obviously knew the roundabout and would love to work there. And then we went back and forth and then I brought... I came back and I said, here's a musical that has not been revived uh, called She Loves Me. And this is something I'd be interested in doing. So we, Todd read it and said, okay. And Roundabout had never really done a musical, really. Huh. And, yeah, and that I mean, was our... Just to back up for yeah, one sec, yeah. I had decided in my new role as artistic director, where I was only really two or three years old, in that position at that time, that one of the things that Roundabout had ignored was doing musical revivals. In those days, and we're going back to the early 90s, the only thing that were, was revived were Fiddler on the Roof and Guys and Dolls and Man of La Mancha every five years. And I felt that there were a wealth of musicals that were of Broadway quality that should be revived. And so that was my concept. I didn't know what I was getting myself into, but that was my idea. Let's bring Jim in. When did you come into the theater? When did you come to the theater? Actually, literally during previews of She Loves okay. Me. I was an agent in Los Angeles and came in to meet Todd during previews at the Criterion Center of She Loves Me, actually. Um, and to introduce him to a couple of clients, actually, Fiona Shaw and Juliet Stevenson were the clients. Um, and we met, and then about a, a couple of months later, I thought, you know, I don't want to be in L.A. anymore. I don't want to be an agent anymore. I'd love to go back to New York and work at a theater. So I called Todd and said, hey, yo, I'd really like to come back to New York and work at a theater. He gave me a job. So that was, that that how was 20 years ago. That's <laughs> how easy it is. Everybody you heard to get hired. Yeah. Yeah. Just give him a call. He'll give, give you a call. call. He'll give you a call. What he's not mentioning is he took a 50% pay cut to um, <laughs> New York to work for me. So now let's, let's move forward. Uh, you go from two little spaces uh, back then uh, when you came on. Where you now have... Uh, One theater. Uh, <laughs> We had the criteria. The criteria, center. right? No, but now moving now, to now, now oh, you have now, five, you have five in, four or five, depending on how you count it. Most uh, five. Okay, five. <laughs> That's how we count it. You have, um, a, you have an empire, and I do wonder with you, Todd. I'm in awe of what you accomplish. When did you sort of think, I'm going to make this big? More I didn't. <laughs> I, I honestly, uh, the one thing I will say is that I did a very smart thing. Uh, which is I always knew I wanted to go into theater, but I got an MBA. Um, <laughs> even though I'm an yeah. artistic director, I got an MBA. And it turned out it was the Jewish mother thing. My mother wanted me to go to law school. <laughs> she said it couldn't hurt. I said it could hurt me. <laughs> but I thought I should have more education, so I got an MBA. And it turned out that it really helped me a lot because theater is, as well as an art form, a business. Mm -hmm. And as we all know from some very, very distinguished theaters that have gone out of business, uh, like Circle Rep and the WPA, which were the hottest theaters when I came to New York. You know, the day you can't meet the payroll, it's not an art form anymore. It's a business. And so um, this was not part of my master plan, to become the largest not-for-profit in America, not even to be on Broadway, let alone to have three Broadway theaters. It was just seizing opportunities as they came along and exploiting them successfully, honestly was not part of a master plan. But do you ever think, this is too much, this is too big, I can't handle it anymore? Uh, I think I, I live in a constant state of terror. <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> he does. Uh, I'm a big fan of a lot of the smaller work you do uh, in the black box theater, deep underground. So far underground, I, you know, it's terrifying to even go down there. And in the Laura Pell's off part of it. But let's, uh, we want to focus on how you put together uh, in this market a big Broadway musical, and once again, you're back with She Loves Me. So let, let's, let's talk a little bit about how that comes together. Uh, first of all, you know, the idea of mounting a new revival. Who, who 
Who brought that forward? She loves me in a way as a decision was a relatively easy one because uh, even though I did not know it well when Scott Bard to me, it became my favorite musical in the world. Um, and had She Loves Me not been successful 20 years ago, uh, we never would have done another musical because we spent a lot of money on it because we didn't know what we were doing. Um, it wasn't Scott's fault. We had no idea what we were it doing. did not know. Um, and had She Loves Me not been a hit, the roundabout never would have done another musical. Instead, we've done 20. Um, so doing a revival of She Loves Me as a nod to our 50th anniversary seemed like kind of a slam dunk. The question was casting it and getting the perfect cast for it. Um, but another example of that, which is where I digress a little, is On the 20th Century, which is a musical that Scott directed last year and uh, we both felt quite passionate about. And this was a musical that most people had considered a dead musical. Even though it was a hit 30 years ago, it had never been revived. And most people's memories of it were vague and it was clear it was never going to be revived commercially on Broadway. And Scott was passionate that this musical could still work if we got the right person. Hey, you had Kristen Channel, but... Well, we didn't did have oh, Kristen Channel. Oh, we right. chased no. Kristen Channel. Oh, no, we chased her. We, went, we decided yeah. we wanted to do this, and then we said, well, there's only one person we thought could do it, so we went after Chenoweth. Max, I really, really love this play. I and that production, in my opinion, totally subjective, turned out to be a magnificent evening in the theater, a perfect production, uh, and... It was almost for most of the audience, not all of them, but for most of them, like seeing a new musical because most people didn't even know it. And so as a not-for-profit theater, that's where I look, that's where I look at the musicals as stretching the bounds. We're not going to do Guys and Dolls. We're just not. It's a great musical, but it's going to be done commercially anyway, done. so why should we do it? You know? Is that your Listen, job to chase Christian Channel with? That's part, yeah, that's a lot of my job. Yeah, totally. Just, I mean, it was three years from first Trying reading to figure that out. production. Yeah. Now, Trying for She Loves Me, of course, you have to have someone who can sing Vanilla Ice Cream. Right. There's so, like four people who can do that. Yeah, I think there's three people on the list, but let's just say there's four. <laughs> but if you don't get her, if you don't get that girl, you can't, there's you no can't do it. No. There's no reason to do it. Seriously, no reason. Well, let's, let's look into that for one second without asking the pointless question of, <laughs> please tell us who else is on that list. Um, <laughs> How can that be true, that there are only three or four people who can produce those notes and play that girl uh, and, you know, give the audience the experience it wants? And can we ask who's doing it now? Laura Bernanke. 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 Because there's two requirements. One, they have to be able to sing the score. But two, they have to be able to act and and be guaranteed, in my opinion, be guaranteed to give a, a Broadway level, extraordinary performance. Okay, not so just that's hit what the narrows down. That's totally, what narrows totally. down. But you're not going to take some Juilliard soprano who just graduated. No matter how good. But it's well, also, also a story about people at a certain age. an age. Yeah. You have she's to be They have yeah. to be they're at a point in their right. lives yeah. that love is not, has not come has their not way. Happened, right. So this is not about young but people. But is, is there also, uh, not to be crass, but a consideration that you have to sell a show. You no. <laughs> that's not, that is not a consideration. No, the consideration in She Loves Me, as it is mm-hmm. in most of our musicals, really is quality. Well, okay. But, but, so it is, but it goes back to a point that I often say about, about star casting, which is if you're looking for someone who embodies the things you need from certain roles, by their very nature, those people are stars. Because if you have a 35 to 40 year old woman who can sing like that and acts like, and can, is that good an actor? They're going to be a star already, a Broadway star anyway, in the musical. I want to jump in and be the devil's advocate with you. That with men, I agree with you. That if you have a certain level of talent and you can do that at this point in your career, you will be a star. But with women, you know, briefly having done casting myself, for the women's project where I saw a lot of women, right. <laughs> you know, you know it, it seems the numbers are so enormous of people that are trying to get into that, that that there's some I just think just missed the boat. Is that, or do you agree, or do you disagree with me? Yes, in some roles. I mean, I think there's some fabulous character actresses yes, out yes. there. But, you mean but if you are talking about a, a leading lady for a musical, yeah, a musical. who, who mm-hmm. can mm-hmm. sing like that, yeah, yeah. you know. You're going to know who they are. You're going to know who they are. There's That's only right. four Laura Bananas. Well, also you have to, the, the show was written to be performed by a certain kind of person. Originally, yeah. it's sort of in the DNA yeah. of these characters that they're not going to be, 
uh, too young and too inexperienced. Right. It was and Barbara Cook, right? Barbara yes. Cook, yeah. who was already a major yeah. star yeah. at that point. And then um, Judy Kuhn yeah. did it for us when we. Okay, so did. you've got your list. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and and is this decision number one? Once you decide you're doing the we show, would not have we would done. Not do she it. loves me. Would not have done. She loves me. And, and Laura we all agreed. Said, yes. Had Laura or one of the other few okay. had said if if Laura had said no, and you know we one would of, not have done it. So you go after Laura, and you have to offer her the stupendous sum of thirteen hundred dollars a week, <laughs> if if that's true. I mean, the uh, people are paid scale and mm -hmm. uh, for the initial run of the show. I assume. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so you're 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 not offering them wealth. That's not the opportunity. I assume the selling point here is this material, mm -hmm. and uh, sort of she's at the someone's at the right age and the that's perfect right. moment to do it. Someone wants to do that role, right. but also it's a it's a it's a show that's never going to get revived yeah. commercially. It's never going to be on Broadway. It's not going to be. No commercial producer is going to say, "Oh, let's do She Loves Me." We'll make ten million dollars. It's not going to happen. And it goes back to what Jim was saying: is that what roundabout and nonprofit theater can offer is we have a limited run doesn't matter what happens, you're going to be seen in this role. People know that you're going to do it. We're not closing in two weeks. You know, you're going to be here doing a role that you really want to do. Now, so that's, that's some commercial producers say, and I'm not playing got you, but some producers say, well, you have the tax break of a not-for-profit, but still you can mount these fabulously expensive productions. And they say, is that fair? I actually have no idea what in the world they're talking about. <laughs> right. They are it's literally like, saying, everybody who says that to me is a multimillionaire. But they do say it. Oh, sure. Yes. Everybody who says that to me is a multimillionaire. I make $450,000 a year. I have no idea what they're talking about. I spend half my life doing nothing but trying to raise money so we can break even on our shows. Yeah. Uh, because we have to raise 40% of our budget through contributions, and we don't pay the artists what they deserve. We have to, they do it out of the goodness of their heart. So I literally think that that argument is not unfair, insane. All right, very okay. good. Do you have to raise money specifically for a production in order to something like this, or is it all part it's of the general? All part of the general budget. Okay. But we think hard about the whole, you know, the, the musicals are very expensive. So every year right. it's a decision. I mean, on the 20th century was a Man. big risk. Expensive. It was very expensive. Very. And had it not been successful, we would have had lost a lot of money. But people expect from the roundabout, at least the main stage, the American Airlines Theater, that they're going to have a fabulous looking production, mm -hmm. a, a beautifully designed, it, I will say extravagant. I mean, from the point is you don't, you don't, you're not knocking it together boards and, 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 you know, and pieces of cloth unless it's the 39 <laughs> steps. Well, would people be disappointed if you didn't have that, if you didn't have that fabulous design of, of a roundabout show? I think in certain musicals, yeah. I yeah. mean, I think they expect it to look... Look, the reality is, the performers know it, the artists know it, and Jesse Green knows it, that they're going... The critics are going to review this show the same way they review any other Broadway show. And the other Broadway... You know, Spider-Woman might spend $80 million. Spider-Man. Spider-Man, sorry. <laughs> might spend $80 million. Spider-Woman wouldn't have spent that much. Others time. may spend $20 million. We might spend... $10 million, but we're all going to get reviewed at that same level standard. Compared to commercial producers who would not put this show on, as you said, but let's say they did, how much less can you do it for? Can you do it for half of what they would? I think it's probably, well, I mean, the biggest difference is probably the actor's the salary, salaries. Yeah, you know? salaries. So yeah. I don't know, it's probably 25% less. So it's, it's not even... Well, it's not just actor salaries, it's also designer salaries. Yeah, everybody, it's every, all the artists. The artists. Directors. You make $1,300? I, I make a little more than that, but all our, we, we work for non-profit, but yeah. when we work for non-profit, we, we understand the, the pros and cons of it. I look, and it is a much more pro. You know, we know that as artists, we're going to go in, we're going to have a show, it's going to run for a certain amount of time. We can get artistic, uh, good people to come in because basically it's a roundabout. It has a great reputation. It has Todd. So all of that is great. On the other side of the commercial run, you know, we're waiting until, you know, 10 o'clock when the reviews come out. Right. And we, then we all meet the next morning and go, are we going to be around? Are we? And, and even once you go to that, that mountain, there's another mountain to, 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 to lift and make sure even if we get good reviews, you know, are I mean, we going to survive? So it's Yeah, you the know. commercial theater model, from my perspective, I'm not an expert on commercial theater. I've never done a commercial production. Um, but the commercial theater model seems to me to be exactly the same as it was 
in the original movie of the producers, <laughs> which is that you raise a lot of money and either you take a 25% chance that you have a huge hit or you have a 75% chance that you lose the money and you go on to the next one and everybody's prepared to lose all the money. We can't do that. You brought up Spider-Man. Mm -hmm. Would you ever, I mean, we're a situation where they set that up and then they let the, the, the genius, the genius, and she is a genius, Julie Tamar, just go. Would you ever take a gambit on an artist that way and just not rein her in and no. just let her go? No. no. Right. Well, that's another thing you can't afford, it, no. it sounds. You, you have to be part, you, you, it, you have to be aware when you come into that situation of what the limitations are and what, what world you're, you're, you're working on. You, you have to be responsible, not only as a theater, but as artists when you're going into the theater, because you have to look at the whole picture. It's just not just your show, it's gonna be 10 other shows, so you have to fit into that. that, that so then this, this leads me to another question, which is how much do you oversee productions that are coming in? I specifically think you did a revival of a great American play, which, did not work out so well. You said to me, oh, you win some and you lose some. You know, mm -hmm. you yourself. And and I sometimes thought, well, didn't he go in there earlier and say to the director, hey, this person's not working, this thing's not working, or did you just stay away from that? I'll tell you, my experience, first of all, I'm not a director. Yeah. So I probably meddle less than other directors who are, other artistic directors mm -hmm. who are directors mm -hmm. probably do. Um, but... And, uh, you know, I'd welcome Scott's view on this, but I, I really think, quite frankly, that when I'm very involved in the casting, and obviously I'm very involved, my major decision is to pick the play and the director, um, and then to participate in the casting with the director. Once the show goes into rehearsal, you know, I think the die is cast. Uh, if the production is not perfect, but pretty good and has some issues, and that happens a lot, where the ending doesn't work or transitions don't work, I can say to the director, although a good director like Scott will see it without me saying anything, look, you know, I think it's great, but this doesn't work and that doesn't work, and I'm not telling you how to fix it, I'm just telling you it needs work. But when a and I won't name any of them, although God knows, Jesse knows, we've had our share of them, when a production, it just goes off the rails and it just yeah. doesn't work out, there's nothing you can do. It's By the too way, late. It, commercially too. So there, there is, you know, put everything commercially up on the thing, you're going to have the same odds, you know. Some of them work, some of them don't work. No one goes in thinking, well, this won't be as good as the last one. You go in thinking, I have the, all the pieces together, and sometimes it does. It goes oh, off track, right. and sometimes it's The only on difference track. with commercial theater is that, at the risk of offending everybody, um, what's happened now in the commercial theater is that you can do a really bad production of a really good play and have a big enough star yeah. that you will sell out at $400 a ticket, um, even though the production is appalling, which really wasn't the case so much 10 or 15 years ago. I want to go back to uh, the off-Broadway stuff just for a minute. I know we don't have a lot That's of time. Right. You have a black box theater deep mm -hmm. underneath the, the uh, Laura Pels, yes. uh, as, as we've said. And one of the things that I really like that while we've got, you know, Laura Benanti and Keira Knightley going on on Broadway, you've got someone I never heard of uh, writing a, a play with a new director, admittedly with Mamie Gummer uh, playing the lead role, but still... You've we got, would have done it either way. Just so right, happens, right. It didn't, it. Need, it didn't need a famous person right. in order to justify... Jesus, great. But just to add something to it, you have yeah. how many people in that audience? 62. 62. The tickets are $25. Mm -hmm. And then those people, um, you know, get to see their plays being done. We've in a, changed the lives of almost every writer that's written. Well, so let's talk about Stephen Karam for a right. minute. Stephen Karam started uh, with you in uh, with Speech and Debate. The, Sp Stephen Karam is the reason for the Roundabout Underground. What happened was nine years ago, um, Stephen Karam brought us a play. I don't know how we got it. I, I think he had an agent, a junior agent at that point. Somehow we got it. And it was called Speech and Debate. And we liked the play, so we did a little reading of it with Sarah Steele in the reading. Um, and at the end of the reading, I said, I want to do this play, but I am terrified of doing it at the Pels because we'll do a $2 million production. And pardon me, Jesse, but the critics <laughs> review things in those large theaters as if they're almost Broadway. Mm -hmm. And... It scares me for a 25-year-old playwright to be reviewed that way. 
And so literally because I liked speech and debate, <laughs> I said, we have to find another space. And it turned out that there was a basement space at the Pells, and we just took a flyer. This was before we lost half of our endowment in 2008. We took a flyer, and we spent a million and a half dollars and built the underground. doesn't look like it cost a hundred million and a half, but it did. <laughs> and the th theory was to have low price tickets, as you mentioned, and most importantly, to give very young American playwrights their first major New York production. So they'd have all the advantage of Roundabout without the pressure of being in a big space. And speech and debate was a hit beyond our wildest dreams. And that started the underground. And every playwright we've had since then has either gone on to moderate or unbelievable success. And Karam's back. Karam did... Um, we Sons of the then did Sons of, Sons of the Prophet at the Pels, which was the finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. And now we're doing his third play called The Humans, which I think is quite extraordinary. So now they're telling me we're running out of tape. Happy anniversary roundabout theater. <laughs> should we sing? Yes. Because <laughs> we dressed alike. We're already so we ready for the barber shop. Uh, like, yeah. We should just go. And congratulations, congratulations, artistic Thank director you. Todd Ames, director of artistic development and casting Jim yep. Carnahan, and associate artistic director Scott Ellis, who's She Loves Me is coming very soon. Coming back. We're, we can't wait. All right. Very happy. Good night, everybody. Good Thank night. you. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you.